Okay, great. Hi, good evening, everybody. Again, welcome to our monthly episode of Cerebrovascular and Skull Base uh, Surgery Symposium at the University of Miami. We usually try to do these every third Thursday. Sometimes we have to make exceptions. So this is our 46th session today on August 11, 2022. A fantastic panel today on petrocleival meningiomas, debate and approaches. I will introduce them at the end of my brief uh, introduction. Uh, we'll join them, uh, my, our current fellow, Matthew Sun, who came to us from UCLA residency in cerebrovascular and skull base. So he will present a case as well as Eva Wu, our PG4 resident, uh, uh, who will also show a case to our panelists for their discussions. And uh, of course, the usual team that makes these webinars uh, what they are. Um, future sessions, please mark your calendars. Next month will be September 15, and the one after that will be October 13. A preview of what's coming on September 15 will be treatment controversies in AVMs with Amir Dedashti, Gary Steinberg, and Adam Arthur. And uh, on October 13 will be surgical management of acoustic neuromas with uh, Ashok Astagiri, Martin Sames, and Mustafa Bashkaya. Of course, uh, the co-directors of this course, Carolina Benjamin, Mike Ivan, and Bobby Stark, uh, uh, I introduce them. And today we have Carolina and Mike with us in the session uh, uh, for this uh, fantastic conversation on petroclival meningiomas. Very briefly, let me introduce our speakers in the order in which they will speak, each about 20 minutes. We have, uh, again, uh, Eduardo Velutini, who was our guest uh, a year and a half ago or so. Eduardo is professor of neurosurgery, uh, runs ne uh, neurosurgery at Hospital Alemao Osvaldo Cruz in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He did his medical school and residency there. Eduardo is a spectacular skull-based surgeon with also particular expertise in endonasal endoscopic and has worked with Aldo Stam for many years. And so I'm, I'm very happy that he's with us. He will tackle the topic, should we do endonasal or transcranial? Next, Siviero Agassi, the uh, uh, upcoming president of the North American Skull Base Society, my neighbor here in Florida, in Tampa, professor of neurosurgery and vice chair of that department where he has been for several years. He's one of the few people who has a heavier accent than I have. Uh, from so, so it's always fun being with him. And Siviero, of course, is a cerebrovascular and skull base uh, surgeon. Thanks, Siviero, for joining us. Last but not least, also again, uh, previously been with us a couple of times at least, Jim Liu, great friend. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Siviero is going to discuss should we go from the top or from the bottom to petroclival meningioma? Jim is professor of neurosurgery and director of cerebrovascular and skull base at Rutger in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, Jim has a very popular uh, follow, uh, list of followers on Twitter. He does put fantastic cases and, uh, and, and uh, shows beautiful uh, pre-ops and post-ops and is of course a spectacular surgeon. And I only regret not having had taken him as a fellow many moons ago when he applied, I should have because of the star that he has become. But uh, Jim, fantastic to have you again. And uh, uh, let, I'll stop sharing. And Eduardo, please uh, unmute your microphone and share your screen. And we are delighted to listen to you. Uh, thank you, Jack. Thank you, James and Siviero for this nice discussion about those meningiomas and uh, congratulations Jax for these webinars they're very famous all the world and a lot of people like them a lot uh, I'm going to talk about posterior fossa meningioma in transclival approach not petroclival not only petroclival but uh, posterior fossa ventral posterior fossa meningiomas yeah? 
I think for the ones who are uh, initiation in the endoscopic surgery, this is the most important slide. This is the multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we have worked together with Dr. Aldo Stam in the last 25, 28 years, and he has brought some high standards of technical endoscopic technical uh, surgery and brought us and we learned a lot with him and brought, brought us to the neurosurgical activity. So, multidisciplinary approach. Andrea Birfulan is was our partner in Brazil. Now he's in Florida, and and he was uh, very enthusiastic of this technique for those ventral posterior fossa meningiomas. This is not new. Try to remove an anterior placed meningioma from an anterior approach to the clivus was not new. Crocker has started this. Uh, from transdoral approach, have some paper with Crocker and Chandra Sain, but they had to, st to step back uh, uh, for two reasons. Because with a microscopic view, they didn't have enough view of the lateral part of the tumor. It was very limited view with the microscopic view, and because of the complications of how to deal with a CSF fistula. But the reason why to think about going anterior is because for clival tumors that are anterior placed, this is the view they have with any posterior approach. You must deal with the tumor and all the lower cranial nerves for the lower clivus tumors are in front of you. You, more, you must work between the nerves. And when you go from anterior place, you have almost nothing in front of you. You just start with the tumor. And with the endoscopic view, you can have a larger and a very zoom uh, view. It's facilitate rail removal. And this is another pa paper that's with an anatomic paper showing that the, if you, which approach gives better or higher uh, area exposition area ex exposition of the clivus you see those blue ones are always the anterior approach they have all they give always a better exposition of the clivus than any posterior approach with all this uh, all this background you see that going anterior first skull base meningioma clivus meningioma have some advantage you go direct approach to the tumor you don't have any brain retraction. You have an early devascularization of the tumor. If you see all the cranial nerves at risk, the sixth nerve is most of risk, uh, cranial nerve at risk. The lower cranial nerves, the seven and eight, are posterior lateral to the tumor. So in most of times, you don't even see them. Of course, there's a limitation. When the tumor, the lateral base of the tumor is the base of the tumor is very lateral. When you don't have a, a sphenoid anatomy favorable, the vascular encasement of the tumor, when it's lower than C1, and of course you need a specialized team with experience in endoscopic surgery. This idea came the first time in 2006 with this patient with the clive meningioma, very centrally placed meningioma. And at that time, we never had the experience for intradural tumor, transclive approach for intradural tumor. And then we start with this patient. At that time, we didn't know how to, we didn't have this uh, hemostatic agent like we have today, this fun, hemostatic fun, magic fun, and how to deal with the basilar plexus. And we were very slowly trying to not deal with the basilar plexus, then we notice that the basilar plexus is not a problem for this intradural meningioma because it infiltrates the dura and the basilar plexus is all, black, all blocked by the tumor. We operate this patient and in 2006, the first one, and this is the, the view we had, uh, uh, residual tumor here, but at the compression of the brainstem. Uh, unfortunately, 
this patient died of pulmonary embolism on the third post-operative day. We could not see what's the result of the CSF isla. We didn't have enough follow-up of this patient. So we were very sad with this case. So we put this uh, by side and we wait. Almost 10 years later, uh, came this patient with hydrocephalus uh, and a sixth nerve uh, on the left side with this tumor. Uh, and we see the basilar is lateral place. The tumor seems not to be so hard on MRI. So we went from the transcliver approach. This was really the first case that we done already with uh, some experience. Then is what we do. We, we drill the whole clivus, the flora is finite sinus, from the cella to the, to the C1 almost. We drill the whole bone, most, most lateral possible, uh, limited by the carotid artery. Then open the dura. You see that there is no bleeding from the basilar plexus. Indeed, when you see bleeding from the basilar plexus is the limit of our tumor. You, you know that after that, upper that or lateral that, you don't have more tumor. Then uh, the book of the tumor, as any meningioma with uh, uh, ultrasonic aspiration or, or coagulation, any kind of debulking. And then we always, uh, not always, but most of the time, we start to try to find a plane, arachnoid plane from the inferior part of the tumor. And you can see CSF coming out. Inferior part of the tumor, time to push the tumor up. Then you can see the neurovascular structures. And then we move the tumor very slowly from the, um, uh, the from the smaller lateral part, in this case, the tumor goes more from the left side, then from inferior, then the, this guy, this, from this patient from the, from the right side, trying to maintain the arachnoid around the tumor and around all the, all the uh, perforators. And this, just like this perforators, try to, maintain and dissect this perforators from the tumor, from the brain stem, from the nerves. Now we are dealing mostly with the six cranial nerve. We don't deal with any seven or lower cranial nerves. And in this case, this is the basilar artery, this left side tumor. We can see here the sixth nerve coming very from below. Six nerve from the left side and still the bulking, removing tumor. And brainstem decompression. In this case, I don't have the end of a surgery. Uh, we usually do fat, fascia, and flap. And for posterior fossa, we usually put a lumbar drain for 24, for 48 hours. In this particular, in this case, we have an atomic lesion of the sixth nerve. Was, it was very adherent to the tumor, to the superface of the tumor. Uh, so we have an atomic lesion of the sixth nerve. But we had a very good removal of the tumor. This is the, you can see the sixth nerve coming out, but you have a lesion in the most distal part of the sixth nerve. This is the sixth nerve from the right side. This patient had a lot of complications due to the CSF leak. We have two surgical revisions. We had to put a shunt because of hydrocephalus, uh, meningitis, and he, she was discharged almost one, one month after the first surgery. And this is the preoperative, then there's a postoperative. I can I'll put here. As you can see, the residual tumor on the left side in 2014. Then, following these patients in 2019, the residual tumor had a little, had to grow a little bit. So, we decide for a gamma knife. And then, 2022, almost the same size 
of the tumor after the gamma knife. She had a permanent six nerve palsy. She was operated from the ophthalmologic surgeon. And now with Prisma glasses, she can have a, a normal vision with Prisma glasses, not without Prisma glasses. This is a, this is a view of the patient uh, this year, 2022. This was the second patient, almost two years after the, that one. And is a patient with uh, also with a uh, six nerve palsy from the right side. If you see this MRI, uh, you see there's a basilar artery or the vertebral artery is lateral place here. And this is a calcification. If there was an encasement of any of this basilar or vertebral artery, we would not do transclival approach. We'll do a postural lateral approach. And it's the same technique. In this, in this patient, we need not to go so further down because the tumor is a little bit higher than the other one. Almost the same technique, the both the tumor from, from below to upper, trying to dissect, find the arteries the, and the, uh, the arachnoid plane, as you can see here, try to maintain the arachnoid intact. This section, two or three hands, or uh, three or four hands, now one hand with the endoscope. Yes, from in this case, the most, the largest part was on the right side. So we start with the left side from the inferior, then left side, then coming to the right side. So you have the vertebral artery here on the, on the left side of the patient. And if you, you see here that the sixth nerve is encased by the tumor, not here in the, in the cisternal part, but as he enters the dura, there's the sixth nerve here entering the tumor. We remove, we decompress the brain stem, sixth nerve in the inferior part of the tumor. We try to remove a little bit more of the tumor and then closing with fat, fascia and flap, what we call the triple F and uh, lumbar drain. This patient didn't have any complication, any CSF fistula. He had a very light six nerve pulse uh, deficit on the right side and have come in normal after two or three months. And this is the residual tumor. We have fallen this patient in about, about almost five years and this residual tumor did not grow till now. This, one, the, this was our fourth case. This patient uh, 30 years only with headache, with very middle place uh, meningioma. I think that's the idea of the ideal case to come from a transcliver approach. And also drilling the bone, limited by the both carotid artery. This is space we have, uh, lateral, lateral space we have to work, opening the dura. The book and the tumor, the same coming from down to up, and then from the most largest tumor, from the smaller parts of the tumor lateral to the largest one. Here from the left to the right side, then starting to decompress the brain stem and try to find the sixth nerve. You can see the sixth nerve on the right side. And, and at the end is the sixth nerve on the left side. You can see fifth nerve, lower cranial nerves here. And in these patients, we follow the sixth nerve on the left side and it was very encased by the tumor. And we left this tumor very at the end to the sixth nerve on the right, on the left side. And this is the sixth nerve on the right side. Uh, uh, totally uh, uh, out of the tumor. And the reconstruction the same way. 
this is the pre-operative, the post-operative, this small rem remnant uh, at the end to the sixth nerve. And uh, we are following this patient. The patient didn't have any complication, no CSF fistula, no, uh, no sixth nerve pulse in the post-operative. We have tried to find some series in the literature. We could not find series in the literature. We found only some case reports from Walter Jean, a case, primary case, transclival, very medially placed tumor, and some residual near the cavernous sinus tumor. And some other cases from other groups, only case reports. So we don't have series from this very uh, hair indication of transclival approach for many angiomas. Huh? If we are, if we are uh, taking in consideration about, uh, we didn't have any 100% gross total removal. Uh, we have 100% of partial removal of subtotal radical removal, but is the, the way we do, we try to preserve, uh, to minimize the morbidity of the, the patient for this benign low low growing tumor and if the tumors grow the residual tumors grow uh, we indicate some gamma, gamma knife treatment and this happens also with the lat with the posterior skull base not in uh, almost fifth um, half of the case uh, the uh, there is some residual tumors and also have some neurologic complications but another indication of a transclival approach for other tumors are as second stage surgery. We have done this with this patient, have been operated twice to a uh, transcondylar approach, or postlateral approach, transcondylar, from a magnum angioma, and they left this tumor and a very other end portion of the tumor here in the medulla oblongata. This is the patient two previous surgeries to the lateral approach, transcondylar approach. So we did an operation of transclival. So this is the patient. We, we, we have done another transcondylar approach, but we have a lot of difficult to remove this part of the tumor, remove the tumor in a uh, cervical transition, but have some difficult to remove this tumor very adherent to the brainstem and very adherent to the lower cranial nerves. So we preserve we we as the symptom of the patient was compression of the of the lower of the medulla we decompress and we stop the surgery here we left this tumor in the upper part we cannot go upper we follow this patient we, she could walk and again again but the tumor the residual tumor has grown and compress the upper part of the medulla oblongata so we decide to go transclival to do a decompression of the brainstem. And the same technique, uh, the, the removal of the clival bone, uh, very, the most lateral extension from the cella to the lower clivus. And we were able, without any additional deficit to the patient, we were able to decompress in this case, particular, we could not go from the uh, from the lower part to the upper part of the tumor because the most other end part of the tumor was due to the previous surgery was the lower part of the tumor. So we start from the lateral, from, then the from upper part to the lower part of the tumor, and we could at the end see the 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 other ends of the tumor from the to the brain stem as a Reoperation, a residual tumor of third surgery, six nerve, and this is the result of the compression of the brainstem, and she could again uh, have better walking. And this is the postoperative. There's in this lower part we cannot remove, very other end to the brainstem. And this is the before the our first surgery was would be the third surgery of a patient. Uh, before our second surgery and after our second surgery, a partial removal, we could get better results, uh, better quality of life for this patient. And in the literature, there's also a case from Kondo, 
that uh, use the transclive approach in this patient after two previous uh, two previous craniotomy or uh, posterior approach trying to remove this tumor and he went as a third surgery from a transclival approach so when you think about this posterior fossa meningioma in conclusion we said we say that is a primary approach in very selected case middle placed tumors in, in which the brain stem decompression is the most important thing for the surgery a very selected place uh, uh, very selected case but can be used as a complementary surgery for residual anterior tumors when you go from a posterior a posterior lateral approach the most difficult part is the anterior part of the tumor just as the tumor that is behind the clivus and can be can be a second approach for removal when there is indication for removal of this residual tumor tumors from the anterior part of the clivus that could uh, that grow again the most important thing that it should not be excluded from the surgical armamentarium and say no uh, uh, operate clival meningiomas from transclival anterior approach doesn't doesn't have any indication do have very limited indications and can be used in this very selected case thank you for your attention Thanks a lot, Eduardo. That was very well done. And uh, it's very clear, I think. By the way, I forgot to tell the audience, please type in your questions in the Q&A area of the Zoom at the bottom right, and we will address them at the end after all speakers have presented. Uh, so you can type them anytime, and I promise you they will be taken care of. So I will save the questions for later anyway. Siviero. Uh, so, is there? Uh, go ahead. Tell us from a. No, Eduardo told us from in front or behind. Now tell us from above or below. Perfect, Jacques. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. And we see the slide. You can see my slide. Well, thank you very much, Jacques, for this invitation. Thank you for putting me between the nose and the ear, so I kind of feel a little squeezed in between. But uh, maybe it's because of my accent. But anyway, I'm very honor to be in this panel. And obviously this is a subject that is very humbling to me, the hospital clava meningioma. And uh, yes, you know, we heard about the transesal approach, transclival, and we're gonna hear uh, after me, Dr. Lou talk about the petrosectomies. So I'm gonna try to focus a little bit on the tentorium, which I think is a structure that is a little bit overlooked uh, in the skull based surgery, but I think is extremely important. So I work at the University of South Florida. This is Tampa General Hospital uh, and this beautiful is Davis Island right here. Let me see if I can get the laser pointer. There we go. So this is my hospital here and uh, Tampa is just a little bit further up north than Miami. So this is where we are, University of South Florida. And you know, hurricane season is about to get its peak right at the end of August. So sometimes that's how Tampa looks when the hurricane is just moving across uh, Florida. So I will be talking to you about it maybe uh, another time. But so the problem with petrocarbon meningioma is the never ending problem of are we going to go above or below? And really, what is the, 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 the separation between these two is the petrous bone, because this tumor often spread and span two separate fossa, the posterior fossa and uh, the uh, middle fossa. Now, again, Dr. Liu is going to talk to you about the petrosectomies, and what I want to call your attention is the tentorium, which we often forget to kind of, of look at it in carefully and to consider how we can handle the tentorium. But I think that we can simplify a lot of our surgeries if we give a little bit more attention to this structure. Now, the tentorium has two parts that are, I would say, painful to deal with. One is the lateral insertion of the tentorium where the tentorium inserts over the petrous apex. And we know that there is a superior petrosal sinus. And that sinus uh, is um, a little bit uh, difficult to deal with. And we know the superior petrosal sinus then merges with the inferior petrosal sinus as it goes into the back of the cavernous sinus. And the sixth cranial nerve, we heard a lot about it in the previous presentation, uh, runs into the inferior petrosal sinus and then merges at that venous confluence before going into the back of the cavernous sinus. 
The other part of the tentorium that is always problematic is the incisura. Why? Because that little nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve, enters into the anterior part of the incisura and is always embedded in that area right where our meningioma is usually inserted. So I trained with Harry Van Loveren and uh, when I arrived here in Tampa in the year 2000, uh, 2003 actually, this was an article that had recently been published and it summarized the Cincinnati experience dealing with those uh, petrocalva meningiomas. And uh, in Cincinnati and in, at that time in the skull based world, the, the, those meningiomas were approached either with an anterior petrosectomy or posterior petrosectomy, depending on the location of the resection of the bone in the relationship to the seven and eight complex. And you will hear in, in a lot more detail uh, later how we make the decision of which petrosectomy to use. But in summary, if the meningioma is above the IAC, I would say mostly above the IAC, then the anterior petrosectomy is a good approach. If it goes below the IAC in that zone two, well, the posterior petrosectomy is a good approach. So kind of in a, in a nutshell, that's how we, we separate them. And so this was the way that meningiomas were removed, every single one of them, when I arrived here in Tampa in the early 2000s. Now let's step back a little bit. I, I think that the 1990s for skull-based surgery was the development of all those very sophisticated approach that were either the OZ's approach, the petrosectomy's approach, and skull base learned how to be exposed completely by this approach. It was a front to back, top to bottom type of approach. And yes, skull base surgeons had to have a big bladder because those surgery were going on forever. And uh, you know, we had to kind of stay in the operating room for all these hours. I think that in the year 2000, by looking at the results of the surgeries from the 1990s, it became more and more uh, familiar to skull-based surgeons that the duration of the surgery was related to the complications, whether it was time-based uh, complication like DVTs, infections, or maybe just complications that were caused by the, the fatigue of the surgery, by the fact that at 5 p.m., 7 p.m., you're not as sharp, you're not as quick, you're not, your judgment is not as good as, for example, at 10 in the morning. So, people started considering how invasive some of these approach were and how invasive those surgery were and trying to think if there was anything else that we could do. And obviously, again, the cranial nerve deficit that unfortunately are part of the skull base uh, surgery, in particular for petrocalva meningioma, well, in the year 2000, we start seeing that those cranial nerve deficit that were inflicted in the 1990s, well, a lot of them were still there or were still recovering. Uh, and these cranial nerve palsies uh, give a lot of, of morbidity to the patients. Now, we know that the 2010s were the explosion of the minimal invasive, and no, no matter how, what you think or what you felt about minimal invasive, you had to admit that you had to really think about the minimal invasive procedure. Why? Because obviously the endoscopic approaches through the nose showed us that you can actually expose the entire skull base in a very minimal invasive way without having to make big incision. At the same time that this concept of, and this push for minimal invasive surgery came, the, the concept of staging surgeries really started taking ground, at least in our department, and realized that sometimes it was better to stop around five o'clock and start again, either a week later, a day later, or a month later, to take that second piece of the tumor, because again, we were more rested. And the concept of subtotal resection, near total resection, especially in acoustic neuroma, suddenly was something that was adopted by everybody. And the nerve-centered resection, the nerve-centered surgery really became something common. Now, why was that? Well, because by the 2010s, the, the track history of radio surgery had been long enough that now it's it, radio surgery was no longer a competitor to skull-based surgery. Back in the 1990s, early 2000s, there was always this surgery versus radio surgery discussion. But by the 2010s, people realized that the result of radio surgery on these residual tumors were so good that really radio surgery was a complement to skull-based surgery. So back in our shop, we started looking at everything we did over the past 10 and 20 years and reanalyzing with a lot of like criticism 
every single step of those approaches to decide whether they were really useful or not. And this is an example of just a simple analysis of what is the role of the zygomatic osteotomy? Do we have to do a zygomatic osteotomy? When I arrived in 2003 in Tampa, every single patient had a full FTOZ for an anterior or middle cranial fossa tumor and also for a posterior cranial fossa tumor. Everybody had it. And nowadays, a complete FTOZ is much more rare than it was before. So we kind of looked at this and trying to see, can we refine the indication to that? So if we go back now to the petrosectomy, we performed a lot of these. And my fellow, my first fellow actually, Jamie Van Gampel, when he was here in Tampa training with me, uh, reviewed all our cases of these petrosectomies. And this to me was a landmark time, not so much for the conclusion because we concluded that, well, it was safe. The anterior petrosectomy was safe, which we knew already. But because by looking at all of these CAT scans, there was something that started uh, coming into my mind that I would like to share with you today, certain concept that started like going around my, my mind. And this is the example of a tumor that was uh, typical here for a petrocalvary meningioma. And you see down here, the little area of the IAC. So if you draw a line across the IAC, you can see that the majority of this tumor is above the IAC but there is a little bit of this tumor that goes below the IAC. So this was a relatively young patient. And we decided that, you know, we had to proceed with a resection. It was symptomatic at the time. I don't remember exactly how, but we proceeded with a complete petrosectomy. And this is a video of that case that I've edited down to just the end of the case to show you the power of the petrosectomies. This is the end of the surgery. And we are looking mostly to the anterior petrosal approach. And here, this is the cut tentorium, we start seeing here Meckelscape, and you will see how this view of the fifth cranial nerve as we peel this tumor out of Meckel's cave is something that is obviously unparalleled. I mean, you cannot uh, find a better exposure to show you that nerve. And you see how it allows a very delicate resection of that last piece of tumor while preserving all the cranial nerve. And the part that is always the most difficult to resect is the part that is obviously right next to the cavernous sinus. And, you know, with the Kawasi approach, with the petrosectomy approach, you cannot get any better exposure to be able to remove that last little part. And not only that, but once you have removed it, and we will see in a second, you can then proceed with coagulating uh, that area to make sure that uh, nothing comes back. Okay. So that's very fantastic. But if we look, this is what the post-op scan of this patient, and this was kind of a one patient in our series, but we paid a big price for that complete resection. It was a complete resection, but this patient woke up aphasic, and lucky for us, he completely recovered. So he had a big venous infarct of the temporal lobe or maybe a retraction injury, but he recovered from that, and he did a very, uh, a very good recovery. Let's look at this other case. This was another lady much more recently that came to my office with a six nerve palsy and facial numbness, okay? And she had this tumor, which once again, you see it's a petroclavra meningioma uh, right here. It's anterior to five mostly. It goes into the cavernous sinus. There is some compression of the brainstem. But this lady was 70 years old and we decided that she probably only needed some little bit of decompression of the temporal lobe and of the brainstem to then proceed with radiation because most of this tumor is inside of the cavernous sinus. And in the end, she was not very symptomatic. So that's what we did. We did an anterior petrosectomy because once again, this is the petrous bone. Most of the tumor was above the IAC. So it was the perfect candidate for an anterior petrosectomy. And this is the post-op MRI. The post-op MRI, yes, this is post-op MRI. You see how most of the tumor is still there. Why is that? Well, because the tumor was extremely adherent to the back of the brainstem, perforators were embedded in the tumor and everything was very stuck and very hard. And the price to pay for this minimal resection, well, look at this encephalomalacia. And I promise you, this was a tumor that was resected, I would say in the, maybe the last uh, three or four years. We didn't use any retractors. You saw that on the first surgery, there was some retractors on the temporal lobe. We quit doing that, again, trying to preserve the temporal lobe. But despite that, there is a big encephalomalacia. Now the patient, she did fine. She was fine, she did well, she was 70 years old. She went back to her usual activities. Her facial numbness got worse, then got better again. So it was okay. We got a good clinical result. 
But when I was looking at this tumor and I start thinking at, at the tentorium and I've put it here in red so it kind of comes across better, you see how 90% of the tumor here is just sitting below the tentorium. And there is a little bit of the tumor that is above. And so I think although the Kawasi approach gives you a perfect exposure of this tumor, was it really necessary to bother the right temporal lobe? And again, it's the non-dominant temporal lobe, but still was it necessary to bother the right temporal lobe? Could we have just maybe gotten by by decompressing the posterior fossa and leaving the temporal lobe alone? And so that's where my thoughts start changing a little bit. And obviously, you know, we never invent anything. I mean, you know, we, we never, it's, we, we stand on the shoulder of the giants. And when I start thinking about using the, the tentorium as a way to direct my approach, that has already been done by uh, giants of skull based surgery, like here, Sami, and then now Tatajiba, Al Mefti, Spetzler. I mean, those are all people that have had the same consideration, measured it, and, and kind of described this in detail. So I'm not presenting anything new. I'm just presenting an evolution of what uh, the, the approach has been in my mind uh, to these tumors. So this is the same case that I showed at the beginning, the patient with whom we are, for whom we uh, achieved the complete resection. We paid the price because we had a temporal contusion. And that, I think, to me, was the index patient because I followed this patient for a long time. That's one of the, the good thing about being in the same uh, university for many, many years that you see you have long-term follow-up on your patients. And 10 years later, this patient who paid the ultimate price for the complete resection, a temporal lobe contusion, but still managed to continue his life and continue working, actually, he presented with a re recurrence 10 years ago, uh, sorry, 10 years after the surgery. And so what did we do? Well, we radiated it, we used radiosurgery, we radiated the residual, and that residual has been stable ever since. But once again, I said, you know what? That is crazy. We went through all this bother, and yet 10 years later, we are back uh, having to radiate this tumor with gamma knife. And so that's where I said, you know, let's, why don't, since, why don't we look at the tentorium and trying to to see if we can do better from below. Because really, the concept of a Kawasi approach, the anterior petrosectomy, is to merge the posterior fossa with the middle fossa by removing the, the petrous apex, cutting the petrosal sinus, and then incising the tentorium. That's how you're going to create one big space for you to work on. Well, but that can be done also from the infratentorial approach. So from below, you might have a much harder time reaching the area laterally, and we're going to talk about this in a second, it's going to be certainly not as easy to take out the petrous apex. But then again, do we really need to do that? But so that's where we started looking at this tumor in a different way. And this is kind of a little bit of an artistic rendition of the retrosigmoid transcentorial approach, where you know we come retrosigmoid and also a lot supracerebellar. And by cutting the tentorium from below, you have this beautiful view from back to front, from below to above, where you can identify early on the PCA, you can identify early on your cranial nerve, and then push and start resecting the tumor towards the posterior clinic process, towards the cavernous sinus, which is where it's all is going to be then inserted and then stuck there. So the retrosigmoid transcentorial approach involves cutting the tentorium from below and here resecting that area of the tentorium that you see that is uh, pushed up by uh, the tumor. Now, this is a video of a case that we did. So the first step that I do is that when I approach these tumors, I de devascularize them from the tentorium, usually using a laser, and that works quite well. And then once the tumor, I've pushed the tumor a little bit away, I try to cut the tentorium. And the, the key to me is to cut the tentorium as far posterior as you can. So away from the tumor, first of all, because it's less vascularized, and second, because it's all a question of the angle that you're going to have. If you cut the tentorium too much anterior, your angle is not going to be very uh, uh, favorable for the resection. So start coming back. And then once you have the tentorium that is cut further back, then you have this kind of plunging view from the bottom up from inferior to and superior that allows you to see the interface between the tumor and the brainstem, the interface between the tumor and the PCA, and the interface between the tumor and the cranial nerves. And I find that it helps me really uh, achieve a very good uh, exposure of that tumor. Now, this area here, obviously, that is the residual tumor. 
So what can you do with that? Well, it depends. It depends on the patient's age. It depends on the remainder of the tumor. And also often it depends on what time it is during the day, because this is the area that is embedded right at the confluence between the incisure of the tentorium, between the superior petrosal sinus, between the inferior petrosal sinus, that's where it goes into Meckel scale. And if you decide that for whatever reason, you really want to go and chase that, then it's okay. You can do the uh, supramietal extension of this approach, which allows you to reach then the area of uh, Meckel's cave. Not very easily, I will uh, admit, even if in theory it's, very, it's, it's been done, it's been described. The actual surgical application of that uh, uh, retrosigmoid supramietal approach is far from being uh, fully straightforward because of the angle that you have to use to get there. But in the end, you can remove a tumor that has mostly pushed the tentorium up and be left with some residual right at the tentorium incisura, but achieve a very good decompression of the brainstem also around that uh, tentorium. So um, there is here a couple of examples of cases uh, where, you know, like here, again, this, this is a petroclava meningioma. And this, again, it's all above the plane of the IAC. So removing this coming from the middle fossa approach, it's kind of a straightforward, it's a, it's a cheap shot. It's on the right side. It's, it's okay. It's good. And if you want to be able to cut the tentorium here, you're going to have to remove a little bit of that petrous apex, and then you're going to have a complete resection. But coming from below, as you can see here, the tentorium is pretty much capping the tumor. So most of the tumor is infratentorial. So going supracerebellar or retrosigmoid, I think would allow you to remove that tumor. And that's what we did in this, uh, in th this young woman. And we did leave a little piece of tumor behind. Now, this piece of tumor, we're gonna have to trust me on that, was not necessarily because we couldn't see it, but it was because that's where all the cranial nerves confluence, the third cranial nerve, the fourth cranial nerve, the sixth cranial nerve, and then also the fifth cranial nerve, but that's much bigger. But all these oculomotor nerve, they all converge towards the posterior clownate process. And yes, you, you, you can try to peel them off, you can peel them off, but we all know that a little diplopia is the same thing as a big diplopia. It's still diplopia and prevents you from driving or forces you to wear prism glasses or requires strabismus surgery. So in order to try to avoid any diplopia, which I think is finally the best outcome, but in this case, I decided to leave a, a small piece of tumor behind right there. And uh, here is kind of- Sorry, an Viero, if you can, maybe one minute, if you can. Okay, I got like 60 minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, How much? No. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, so- yeah, but, but Maybe two or three minutes if you want. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So I didn't start my, my, my clock on the right time. But anyway, so this is the explanation of why this is it. I mean, this, those are all the cranial nerves that merge in the posterior of the cavernous sinus. So we reviewed our cases. This is an article that we published where we reviewed all the cases that were published with Kawase approach, operated with Kawase approach, and the ones that we operated with the retrosigmoid transcentorial approach. And this is, uh, we found that the time of the surgery was obviously less because there is no petrosectomy associated with that, which we thought it was good. We had a bit less blood loss, but, but the extent of resection was about the same. We often leave pieces behind, whether it's with the retrosigmoid, infratentorial, and transtentorial, whether it's with the Kawase. And the complication profile was, was, was quite good. So limitations were quick. The limitations, there are some limitations. This is a case that I took where I left a big chunk of tumor right there. I could not reach it with my transtentorial approach. And the reason being that here, the PCA was completely embedded in the tumor. So there are certain limitations. And I would say that if this is the tentorium and the tumor is most in the middle fossa, don't try to go at it from below because you're gonna leave a bunch of tumor behind that is very easy to reach from there. Uh, if the, and this is the, the, the picture. So if the tumor goes mostly lateral to this vertical line through the uh, origin of the tentorium, I would go uh, middle fossa. So this is a good retrosigmoid transcentorial. This is not a good retrosigmoid transcentorial. Similarly, if you draw this line across along the superpetrosal sinus, if you have a huge amount of tumor in front of that line, well, that's not gonna be a good case for a retrosigmoid transcentorial. And finally, to me, the limit of this approach is really what the tumor does with the anatomy, with the brain uh, stem, with the PCA, with the cranial nerve, because to me, that's where your residual will be. So from the top or from the bottom, well, I decided a few years ago to try hard as hell to save the temporal lobe. So my default approach is really 
from the bottom, but obviously there is a lot of limits to this approach and they have to be recognized. I sometimes stage my surgeries, but always start from the bottom and obviously adjuvant therapies, I think are very important. Thank you very much. And I hope I did not spill too much. In, in no, no, that's good. That's very good, Severo. Thank you. This is lots of good material to, to engage the audience in. Uh, and I'm glad I can see some questions uh, coming in. Uh, glad to see our good friend, Walter Jean joining us. Uh, he's very passionate about petroclival meningiomas. Walter, I know you can't answer me, but uh, I'm saying hi. Uh, okay, Jim, let's, uh, let's see. Is there a need for a petrosectomy or can everything be done through retrosigmoid? Tell us your opinion on this. Great. Thank you. Can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay. Microphone is good? It's very good. Great. Well, thank you, Jacques. Thank you for uh, hosting this and, and inviting me. It's a, it's a true honor and pleasure, and, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, although I, I was not your fellow in a formal sense, I, I want to say that I've learned many things from you over the years, and, and even as a message to the trainees in the audience, uh, you can learn from everyone around you and everyone can be your teacher. And I feel that throughout my career, I, I've been influenced by many people and, uh, and many of who are on this panel as well. So uh, some of my ideas you may have heard from, from Jacques and I, and I credit you for shaping some of my thinking when it comes to petroclival meningiomas. Um, so when we talk about meningi petroclival, I just sort of want to set the, the definition, but the, these are very rare uh, meningiomas and considered the most formidable and treacherous, mostly because they often involve multiple compartments, middle fossa and posterior fossa, as you've seen. They can often compress the brainstem and involve intimately the vascular perforators and, and cranial nerve, sometimes encasement. And if you look at the large series from all the, the big giants in our field, this is the series from Fukushima, where he's concluded that selectively pursuing a near total rather than gross total is better. Uh, here's the one from Professor Shekhar, similar message, aggressive but judicious tumor resection. And as you can see, these are all mostly subtotal removals. And then the one from Al Mefti, again, similar message where I think we have to consider quality of life and preservation of cranial nerves because these are very challenging tumors. So we have, as Severo mentioned, uh, a swing in the pendulum where we've gone from very radical gross totals to more conservative uh, subtotal resections, keeping quality of life in mind. Um, so, and then this is the, the paper from Volker Seifert, again, uh, after, after 20 years of, of reflection, uh, that our goal is to really preserve quality of life and tumor control with excellent cranial nerve function. So what is the true definition of a petroclival? We often see a lot of CP angle meningiomas. Some are tentorial uh, origin, some are anterior petrus, posterior petrus, uh, some are CP angle. And so there's a whole variety of different types of CP angle meningiomas. And I, I think for this discussion, I wanted to lay this definition straight, but for the purposes of education, you, I will show you cases of various posterior fossa meningiomas where different approaches can be more suitable for specific tumors. So these generally originate medial to the fifth nerve and are limited to the upper two thirds of the clivus, whereas the lower one third of the clivus is generally reserved as foramen magnum meningiomas. Um, these are the various approaches to the CP angle and posterior fossa, and of course you see here retrosigmoid is the workhorse. And I think we have to be like, uh, like archaeologists or, or artists like Michelangelo, where this is the, the, his statue David in the city of Florence in the, in the museum. And um, you have to be able to visualize the structures deep within the rock. And Jacques taught me this concept of when you're doing petrosectomies, you have to have this attitude of knowing how to conquer the rock. And uh, when we look at the clivus, I know uh, Siviero mentioned the paper from Cincinnati with Dr. Aziz about dividing the clivus into thirds. 
But uh, I've learned over the years from Jacques that we can divide the clivus into fourths based on the cranial nerve uh, foramina, whereas the upper fourth generally we can access through an approach from above, an FTOZ to the posterior clinoid. And then one of my favorite approaches, the Kawasi's approach, uh, anterior patrosal approach, really gives you this window between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And this is a great uh, corridor to use in, in, the, in the appropriate um, uh, indication. And then as you go lower, uh, below the seventh nerve, I will often combine both anterior and posterior patrosal approaches. Some just do a posterior patrosal, but I'll show you in some cases where doing a combined patrosal gives you that extra access. And of course, the lower fourth is uh, reserved for far lateral approach, working underneath the lower cranial nerves. And as Eduardo showed us, uh, uh, there's the workhorse retrosigmoid. And as Eduardo showed us, uh, the endonasal approach, far medial, for the more midline clival lesions. So this is the view that you get with the retrosigmoid. This is a photograph from Roten's dissection. This is the workhorse with the retrosigmoid. And it's important to study the radiograph preoperatively to determine whether when you're working in this corridor, is the tumor going to be pushing the cranial nerves ventrally or is the tumor anterior to the nerves pushing the nerves towards the surgeon? And I think that's important because when you're dealing with a medially based tumor and the tumor is in front of the nerves, it can make the surgery a lot more difficult and a lot more risk with manipulating these nerves working in between these tight spaces. And I think that's where the petrosectomies can, can offer an advantage, which I'll show you in a moment. So here's a, a, a case of a, what I call a petrotentorial meningioma. It's not a true petroclival. So my anticipation, and when I look at the Fiesta skin on this, is that the fifth nerve is gonna be pushed medially. And if it's a true tentorial meningioma, the fifth and the seventh nerve skin tend to be pushed downwards. So with a, a tumor like this, I will choose a, a simple retrosigmoid approach. Uh, here's the video. Um, the first step is generally releasing CSF from the lower cisterns. You see the lower cranial nerves visualized there. And then you aim for the top, meaning you aim for the tentorium and the petrous junction, that petrotentorial corner of that working corridor. And here we're drilling off the supramiatal tubercle. Oftentimes this can be a little bulky and it blocks your view of getting more anterior. So you do have to drill this down. It can be helpful. Be mindful of the air cells. Very important to study the CT of the temporal bone to make sure there's no pneumatization that you don't get into hidden air cells. I would advise putting an endoscope at the end to look along that petrous surface to make sure there's no hidden air cells that's out of your line of sight. And generally, the tumor is, with any meningioma surgery, to debulk and then extracapsular collapsing of the capsule, peeling it off the neurovascular structures. And here we're dissecting it off the brainstem. And here are the rootlets of five. Notice how the rootlets of five are pushed downwards right next to seven. So seven and five are now in the same plane. And we're working all above seven. So we have this uh, beautiful corridor working above seven and the tentorium and you can see the the tumor origin is really at that petro tentorial junction and then we'll remove this portion and then we'll go back and remove the remnant there's the sixth nerve and the basilar artery more medially and there's the brain stem and then there's the lower cranial nerves so a nice view there's the fourth nerve at the top and then there's the repair so a complete removal here uh, neurologically intact good outcome and a good, good selection for retrosigmoid. Here's another uh, petrotentorial meningioma, a little bit larger, but extension into the IAC. So this is a, a great approach using a retrosigmoid transmeatal, similar to what you would do for an acoustic neuroma, where you drill off the uh, posterior meatus to remove the intracanalicular tumor. Interestingly, she presented with hearing loss and her hearing surprisingly actually improved after removal of the meningioma. And then this one here is a true petroclival. You could see the positioning and the origin of the tumor is more medial, and it's medial to the seventh and fifth nerve complex here. 
And this was a more elderly gentleman who had some medical comorbidities. So my idea here was to do a retrosigmoid approach and, and to really, with the goal of debulking, you could see the basilar arteries encased here, very dangerous. The other thing you want to look for on these tumors, if there's any cobble stoning on the brainstem or any T2 changes in the brainstem, that usually signifies that there's peel invasion into the brainstem and you don't want to try to peel it off the brainstem. That's when you can get vascular injury to the brainstem and, and very bad outcomes. So here the goal was to debulk and I left a thin layer along the brainstem and around the basilar artery. So this is what I, what I would call a maximal safe debulking. And uh, it was an atypical grade two meningioma, so I treated it with IMRT. And interestingly, to my uh, surprise, you can see here is the residual, residual, and it actually shrunk after some radiation therapy. And he's done well with uh, improved gait function. So when do we use the more uh, involved sophisticated petrosectomies? Let's talk about the anterior petrosectomy first. Here is a patient with an upper petroclival meningioma. You can see it's above and below the tentorium. There's a medial component here and then an infratentorial component here. And I always like to study the fiesta to try to see where the position of the cranial nerves are. Here's the trigeminal nerve, here's Meckel's cave, and the tumor is situated medial to the fifth nerve. So I, based on this, I would say this is a true petroclival. And so my approach here would be a, do a Kowasi's approach. It does not go below the, uh, the seventh nerve, and it's upper petroclival. So the way you do this is through a middle fossa craniotomy. I like to do it uh, a wider craniotomy because it, it allows you more mobility and surgical freedom. You don't get limited by the bone edges of the craniotomy. And then when you find the GSPN, peel the dura propria off of the base of the middle fossa from posterior to anterior, and the GSPN will take you to the V3, uh, back of the V3 going into foramen ovale. And this is where you can divide the periosteum and do an interdural splitting by elevating the dura propria, which is the temporal lobe dura, off of the periosteal layer of V3. And it can get very adherent, so you should use some sharp dissection to start peeling off that dura propria. I like to decompress the foramen ovale. This allows me to mobilize and untether V3 so I can mobilize V3 anteriorly. And I think there's V3 now decompressed. And when you elevate V3 anteriorly, you want to identify the middle fossa rhomboid. So it's bordered by V3, GSPN, arcuate eminence, and the medial petrous ridge. When you bisect that angle, that's relative where the IAC is, and anteromedial to that is the cochlea. So you want to preserve the cochlea when you drill. And we typically drill from medial to lateral using eggshelling technique with high-speed diamond burr and a lot of copious irrigation. But I can mobilize V3 anteriorly to get right into that trigeminal depression. And after you do the middle fossa rhomboidectomy, petrosectomy, we'll go subtemporal. We'll find the supratentorial component of the tumor that's subtemporally right, hinging around that tentorial edge, debulking the tumor, and then peeling the tumor arachnoid away from the tumor capsule. And then this will allow us to fall into the posterior fossa. So here is the uh, medial portion. You want to be careful to look for the fourth nerve as we're doing this. And so we'll continue to debulk more of this tumor, get it out of the way. So now we're going to cut the tentorium. And this is how you communicate the posterior and middle fossa. So when we cut the lateral edge of the tentorium, you enter the superior petrosal sinus, which I'm coagulating here. You can either put clips or coagulate or tie it off with a suture. Then you cut the posterior fossa dura. So now you're, you're straddling the tentorium. You have control above and below the tentorium and you can cut it through and through to the incisura free edge and then open up the posterior fossa dura to expose more of the brain stem. Here is Dandy's vein. This is the superior petrosal vein. I'm gonna coagulate it right at the insertion here so I preserve this on passage flow of the venous flow. And, and the key maneuver here is really opening up this fibrous ring of the porous trigeminus. You follow the trigeminal nerve into Meckel's cave you open up that dural ring and look, 
This is Meckel's cave. This is how you get the tumor into Meckel's cave. Look how it's anterior to cranial nerve five. So the beauty of the Kawazi's approach is that it allows you to land anterior to the cranial nerves, anterior to the brainstem, and you get this beautiful wide exposure, and you can get all of that tumor in Meckel's cave. Alternatively, if you did it through a retrosigmoid, you would do what's called the RISA approach, which is a retrosigmoid intradural supermeatal drilling that gets you into Meckel's cave through that retrosigmoid corridor. And that is certainly an option, but I prefer this option it give, I because I believe this is the shortest distance to Meckel's cave, and you have a wide exposure. You don't need an endoscope to look into Meckel's cave. You can get two-handed arachnoid dissection to get this tumor off. Look at the basilar artery. Look at the brain stem. And then remember reconstruction is important. Sometimes there's petrous air cells you have to wax off, put a little bit of fat in there into the petrous apex. Don't overpack it. You could get temporal lobe compression and herniation, so just use very little. The fat sometimes can swell, and then I like to use a vascularized pericranial flap hinged posteriorly to get this nice reconstruction to prevent CSF leak. So here's a complete removal, and the um, patient was neurologically intact. Now this is an, an anterior patrol meningioma I did recently. It was a growing tumor. Look at the indentation of the brain stem, and look at the position that it's right just above IAC, but a little bit in front. And so I think you can certainly consider doing this through retrosigmoid approach. And I debated long about retrosigmoid versus anterior petrosal, but I'll show you my thinking behind this. The tumor is situated between five and seven, so you can have an option of doing this Kawasi's approach. But when you think about retrosigmoid, think about the slope of the petrous bone. And so study the CT scan carefully. This is the slope of the petrous bone. So to get to the anterior part of the tumor, you have to drill uh, a lot of the petrous bone intradurally because the angle is more steeper. So if you do it through retrosigmoid, rem just understand uh, this challenge that you may face. So I ended up doing uh, a Kawasi's approach and the tumor literally just came right off of the brain stem. It was a, a great approach to use uh, in my mind for this, for this particular case. What about the combined petrosal approaches? So this is a much larger tumor. It's going up above the tentorium, a lot of brainstem compression here. So I, I generally would use a bigger approach in this one, uh, a C-shaped incision in the lateral position, uh, lumbar drainage. This is the illustration from El Mefti's chapter using a, a combined petrosal where you do a pre-sigmoid petrosectomy preserving the labyrinth uh, block, the otic capsule, and then doing an anterior petrosectomy like I showed you. And then this gives you this type of approach when you make a pre-sigmoid subtentorial exposure. And again, harvesting a pericranial flap, and then we'll do our posterior petrosectomy. So here's the otic capsule. This is the lateral canal, posterior canal, mm -hmm. superior canal. And uh, we'll do our anterior petrosectomy here. So we'll add a anterior petrosectomy. So I like to do that because I think it gives you additional exposure subtemporally, uh, and you can get great access to Meckel's cave in addition to all the advantages of the retro labyrinthian exposure. So we're gonna tie off the superior petrosal sinus. Be very careful of the veins of Lebay because there can be more than one, and they will drain into the transverse sigmoid junction from the posterior temporal lobes, so make sure you protect them. And so now we're just working pre-sigmoid. There's seventh and eighth nerve complex, so the tumor's all above seven and eight. And so this makes this window quite favorable. We're now peeling the tumor away from the brainstem surface that you see here. And then we'll cut the tentorium towards Meckel's cave. And you can see as we're cutting it, we're coagulating as well. So this really helps devascularize the tumor. So by the time you're taking out the tumor, it can be quite soft by the time you devascularize it. So that's one advantage of doing these petrosectomies is that you can get early devascularization of the tumor as some of these tumors can be fed by the tentorial artery of Bernasconi Casanari. And so here, again, more sharp dissection and then peeling the tumor out of uh, Meckel's cave here. I 
I generally try not to coagulate uh, too much uh, during these tumor surgery. It oozes and I just let it bleed. I, I'm, I'm always afraid that if you coagulate too much, there may be a plane where the nerve is attached that you don't see and you end up cooking the nerve with your, uh, your bipolar. So uh, it, start, it stops bleeding once you take the tumor out. So here's the repair uh, to prevent CSF leak. And this is the, uh, what Almefti calls the double martini, the double patrosal, coming in pre-sigmoid, anterior petrosectomy, and then preserving the otic capsule. And then here's the immediate post-op scan. And then here's the scan at three months. And uh, she did quite well. Uh, no, cran no cranial nerve deficits. So when we talk about these petrosectomies, there's different variations. A lot of it is based on hearing status. So if your hearing is good, you can go retrolab. So pay attention to this block of bone here. This is a retrolab petrosectomy. Uh, you can also do a variation, which I'll show you, called the transcrucial, where you take off the superior and posterior canals, and you have to wax the ampulated ends to prevent the endolymph from falling out and you can potentially preserve hearing. And then of course, if the hearing is gone, you could do a trans lab that really gets you this wide exposure. And of course, the, 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 uh, the big one is the transcochlear approach where you decompress the facial nerve and mobilize it posteriorly and you can drill a cochlea and expose the vertical petrous ICA. So this approach we rarely do uh, anymore because this generally results in a uh, facial nerve palsy invariably that only recovers to only about a Brachman three. So generally that's not used as much, but here's the transcrucial approach. When you're drilling off these superior and posterior canals, you plug up the uh, ampulated ends with bone wax, but you get this extra view. And I'll show you an example. So here's a large tumor that I did through a transcrucial with a petrosectomy anteriorly. Look at the shape of the brainstem. To do this retrosigmoid, there would be a lot of mobilization and retraction of the brainstem and cerebellum to get to the medial portion. Uh, and so it's a lot of supratentorial involvement. There's also Meckel's cave involvement. So my treatment strategy here really is, can you do a retrosigmoid? Probably limited. A posterior petrosectomy is, uh, can be used, but an anterior petrus can also be used, but my preference here is to do a combined patrosal with a transcrucial variant, which I showed you here, and we often will use endoscopic assistance at the end, and we recently published this particular video. I'll show you here quickly. Here's a C-shaped incision, elevating the uh, temporalis. We do a stage procedure here. It's a bit long case, so oftentimes I'll do the petrosectomy stage one, and then we'll do the tumor removal stage two. So here is the stage two uh, after stage one. This is uh, the retro lab. So here's the uh, otic capsule here. You can see here is the otic capsule, lateral, superior, and posterior canal. Now we're gonna elevate the dura uh, subtemporally, ligate the foramen spinosum, and then incise the uh, dura propria, peeling off the dura off of GSPN from posterior to anterior, exposing the petrous apex middle fossa rhomboid. We're gonna stimulate the GSPN. Here's the GSPN, arcuate eminence. This is the middle fossa rhomboid. So this is the anterior petrous apex that's being drilled out. And then now that we can do this, we can now hug the uh, uh, posterior uh, petrosectomy region we're now doing the transcrucial where we're now drilling off the superior canal and waxing off the ampulated ends. And you have, I like to do this with uh, running water so you don't lose the endolymph. There's the membranous canal, we're gonna wax that off and then finish off the transcrucial petrosectomy. But I want you to appreciate, look at this view that you get. Look how much steeper you can get just behind the lateral canal and, and facial nerve, you go very anteriorly. You have the both uh, petrosectomy, uh, transcrucial and anterior petrus. And I believe this gives you uh, what I would call a maximal hearing sparing petrosectomy. So you can still, this is the most bone you can remove while still potentially preserving hearing. Again, watch for the veins of LeBay. Look how the vein of LeBay stuck to the dura. So. I can't elevate it, it's stuck, so I'm gonna make a cut around it, 
and leave the vein attached to the dural remnant. And then I have a free edge to tie off the superior petrosal sinus. And then I can start uh, exposing the tumor. Here's the cranial nerves. We're going to work above seven here. Start debulking the tumor. Here's the fifth nerve. Jim, in a couple of minutes, please. Okay. Thanks. We'll wrap it up here. This is the last video, actually. There's the basilar artery. And then this is the top portion of the tumor. So I generally reserve the retractor at the very end just to hold the brain upward so I can use two free hands so I can really identify the fourth nerve. The tumor is going to, the tumor arachnoid stuck to the fourth nerve, but you can dissect it out and just carefully uh, find the arachnoid attachments and then uh, remove this last portion here. And then there's the, uh, the final view. You can see there's the lower cranial nerves. And then we'll use an endoscope for inspection. Um, and then there's this, the fifth nerve. And then here, here's the sixth nerve right here. Sixth nerve, and then there's Meckel's cave. So here's the post-op scan. Uh, we were able to preserve hearing in this, and as well as facial nerve. And here's another few recent cases. Uh, again, this one I had to leave some tumors invading the brainstem. Look at the cobble stoning again, some edema in the brainstem, so be aware of those findings. Uh, so, and then here's another uh, a radical subtotal, another radical uh, subtotal exposure here. So my, my point is here is that we have to be able to tailor these uh, resections and if we're going to make a radiosurgical target, let's try to make the most ideal, smallest radiosurgical target uh, that you could see here. So this was a, a sphenopetroclival meningioma. Uh, with, we did a multi-stage multi -stage procedure, and, and she's had a pretty good quality of life. So I think, in conclusion, we want to achieve the best maximal safe resection, preserve the brainstem and cranial nerves, and remember to use adjuvant IMRT or SRS in our armamentarium. And I think, I really do think these transpetrosal approaches remain important strategies in our armamentarium as we treat a lot of these complex posterior faucet meningiomas. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Very nice cases, very nice exposition of the rationale for uh, uh, the petrosal approaches and their variants. Um, so I think what we'll do next, let's have uh, Eva Wu present a case to the panelists for discussion. Uh, then uh, Matthew Sun will do that. And then perhaps Carolina, my partner after that, can lead a discussion with you folks and, and audience conversations and questions. Eva, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so this is uh, our first case of uh, Dr. Morcosis. So let me just, um, so it's a 60 year old uh, man who initially presented with imbalance and diplopia for one year and on exam, he had some horizontal diplopia when he looked to the left and then uh, speech discrimination score was about 88% on the left and then had gait instability, but was otherwise intact. And so here's his uh, post-op, or I mean his pre-op MRI. You can see it goes uh, above the um, posterior clinoid, goes a little bit below uh, the IAC. There's not really much brainstem edema at all. Um, it almost encases the carotid, uh, the uh, vertebral, or the basilar artery. Um, and then it goes, you know, mostly uh, infratentorial and then some uh, supratentorial. And so here's just, uh, I'll show you the still shots just so you can see a little bit clearer. So it goes a little bit into Meckel's cave right here. And then it goes in below the IAC right here. And so here's just the coronal. Um, so mostly within uh, uh, just a little bit in the middle fossa, but mostly posterior fossa. And then it goes um, uh, superior to uh, the posterior clinoid and then uh, down to here below the IAC. And so here's the uh, T2 again. So not really any brainstem edema. 
And then we just wanted to ask, you know, our first question for the audience is for this, so for the 60 year old with this lesion that's causing, you know, some obstructive hydrocephalus and some uh, horizontal diplopia with left gaze and then hypoacusis and then uh, gait instability, you know, first is how would you classify this lesion um, and, you know, explain your nomenclature in general, which Dr. Uh, Liu kind of already went over in his lecture. Um, Eduardo, how, how do you, do you call this one a pitroclival? I would say this is a pitroclival minijoma and we'll use, use what James said, pitrotentorial meningioma, because from pitroclival and goes through the tentorial and, and goes to the, to the supratentorial part of the brain, the middle fossa. You, you know, the ones I call pitrotentorial are not pitroclival. At the, you know, it shows you how we all massage the nomenclature to, to what we're used but, to. When, but, when I but, call pitrotentorial, it means it's an easy one, meaning it's petrus, it's anterior petrus went to the tentorium as opposed to went to the clivus. But, you know, that's why... Yes, that's just from the superior part and go, right. goes down in the posterior fossa, in the anterior part of the tentorium. But okay. I think... But I think this would be a pitroclival with tentorial extension. Yeah, we'll we'll ask you in a second how you might approach it. Uh, okay, Siviero, uh, what do you agree with that? No, that's how you call it too. Uh, you're muted. What happened? Oh, unmute yourself, Siviero. There you go. Perfect. I, I was trying to find the mouse. Um, Yes, if I'm not mistaken, this tumor also goes towards the cavern sinus. I mm -hmm. mean, there's quite a significant anterior extension, or did I miss misread that? Uh, yeah, there is. It goes a little bit into the cavernous sinus too. Because, yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly. I think it's most likely uh, medial to the uh, to the trigeminal nerve, and I agree with that definition. And I would call this a petroclival, and probably like cavern of petroclavum in Geoba, because I think when we remove that tumor, we're going to have to take into consideration the extension anteriorly, as well as the extension down in the posterior fossa. You, you know, I, you know, I, I don't think it's in the cavernous sinus. I don't, I can't show you my mouse, but it's really in Meckel's cave. If you draw a line where it stops, it's just Meckel's cave. And the reason I, I bring this on is, you know, I've had many cases referred so-called inoperable because they're in the cavernous sinus. They're not, they're in Meckel's cave, at least the ones up. Of course, many of them are in the cavernous sinus. But so this one is Meckel's cave. And that's what I want the audience to realize that Meckel's cave, as Jim has shown beautifully in that Kawazi case he did. And it's, it's, it's so easy. That part is so easy. It's not, the, I, I don't consider this intracavernous yet. It will become intracavernous if we let it grow. But uh, Jim, what do you what do you call this tumor, petroclival as well? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I would call this petroclival with Meckel's cave extension. And I think it's um, when you look on the radiograph, one of the things I look for is you, you compare the coronal to the axial. The Meckel's cave, I don't have a mouse, but Meckel's cave on the coronal is in that spot and you have a normal side to compare with. So the cavernous sinus is just a touch anterior to Meckel's cave. Meckel's cave is sort of that back pocket, right where the fist exactly. is. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Eva, what's your second question to them? Yeah, so our second question is, yeah, you know, what would they do to manage this patient? Would they do observation, um, you know, photon or proton radiation, multi-session radiosurgery or microsurgery? And um, if microsurgery, what approach would they do? Okay, Eduardo, why don't you tell us okay. how you approach it? Do you want the picture, the MR again? Go back to the MRI. Yeah, uh, please. Okay. Is this That's a okay. good one for an endonasal? Yes. Of course not. <laughs> good. Let the audience hear you. Yes, perfect. <laughs> of course not. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm from the, as Siviero uh, said, in the nineties. We used to try large approaches to remove total the tumor. We want to see a, a clean MRI and doesn't not for a quality of life of the patient. So and I have done a lot of large approaches for a lot of tumors and three, four hours of approach, then you 
go and you cannot remove the tumor because of perforators, because of the heart tumor, or because of other ends to the brain stain. And, and, and we had some patients that we left a residual tumor in their brain stem, but trying to remove this tumor, uh, we, the patient woke up with an um, hemiplegic with third nerve. Uh, this was in 89, 1989. I followed this patient for 30 years almost, and the, the residual tumor was exactly the same as the postoperative MRI. And the patient was hemiplegic and the third nerve. So, yeah. leave some residual tumor is very nice. So, uh, another, what, what do you do for petroclavian in general? What is the main purpose of the surgery? Also, <coughs> which symptom the patient had? This, this patient, uh, and we go straight to the, to, to the approach, uh, inferior or superior, depends on the what we want to, uh, to do a better quality of, quality of life for the patient. And this patient had some uh, imbalance. So the compression of the brain stem is the, uh, the, the, uh, the purpose of the surgery. Of course, radical removal is always a purpose, but uh, sometimes we try to do an approach and not radical, uh, uh, intending to do a radical removal, but we do not do what we want, the compress the brain stem. Most of the time, a good retrosigmoid approach. In this patient, we could go a retrosigmoid approach with a transtentorial approach, open the transtentorial, and we could decompress also the supratentorial approach. And decompress the brainstem was the purpose of the surgery. Of course, anterior pretorial approach was also a good approach, but this left side uh, temporal lobe retraction, the left side, and I always prefer to retract cerebellum than the temporal lobe. Uh, if you ask the patient, we have operated a lot of patients in two stages, trans cerebellum, uh, head sigmoid, and then middle fast approach. And the patient said, Doctor, why you don't operate always from the posterior heterosigmoid? It's much better for the patient. So, I would try to decompress the brain stem, head sigmoid, open the tentorial, and remove as much as possible of the middle fossa approach. If not possible, depends on the age, on the symptoms, follow and then do a second stage a middle fossa approach. Okay. Siviero, how is this done in Tampa today? I think Eduardo like, stole my words because I, 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 well, I first agree with him. This is a formidable tumor. I think certainly a petrosectomy will work no matter what. But what worries me a bit about it is that the surface of the tumor is very irregular. So there's a lot of lumps and bumps. I, I like the word that Jim used, cobblestoning. I, I call it cauliflowers, but I'm gonna start using cobblestoning, it's better. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's absolutely true. I mean, these tumors, they often have stuff in between those creases, whether it's nerves, blood vessels, perforators, and so that I think is extremely worrisome uh, for these patients and makes me believe that a complete resection or even a near total resection is gonna be hard to achieve, not impossible, but hard to achieve. So it extends quite, quite high up. And so I think that yes, if you come middle fast Sakawase, you'll be able to go down very well, but that part that goes high up, you're gonna to have to retract the temporal lobe just to reach it. Even if you take out the zygomatic arch, even if you do everything that you want, it's gonna be very high up. So I agree with Eduardo that, uh, you know, obviously since I spoke about this, I need to defend it a little bit. If you go retrosigmoid transtentorial, you will have access to the posterior part of this tumor. And actually from, from, low, to high, from low to high, you will, able, you will be able to debulk a ton of that part that goes above the tentorium. It's not gonna be a complete resection, far from there. But after you're done with that, you can look at your post-op MRI and depending on how much that part of the middle fossa has fallen down because you have debulked it from the inside, I think it would make the second stage, which could be a kawase or a middle fossa, I think would make the second stage uh, easier to do. And then maybe if you're lucky, not necessary to do, but I suspect that that would require a second stage. Okay, Jim. 
Yeah, I, I, I think of this a little bit differently. I know you can, if your goal is debulking, one can choose retrosigmoid and debulk. My, my concern is when I have a big tumor like this, and there's a, a lot of features that dictate it to, or that indicate that a complete removal may not be possible. So I think we're gonna get a, my goal here is a radical near total based on the features we mentioned. But I, I would prefer a combined patrosal here, an anterior petrosectomy, and if his hearing is still good, a retrolab. If his hearing is out, you could do translab. And if the hearing is still somewhat good, I would do transcrucial. But my philosophy is that on a big tumor like this, I want to see the borders of it. So if I'm debulking, I want to see the margins on the other side because when you're debulking only from one angle, it's really hard to predict where the other side is. Uh, and, and image guidance tends to underestimate how much residual it is at the other end. And so if you know where the borders are, you can get better control. And uh, I, I think you, generally I feel that it's safer. You just have more room to, to handle where, where the interface to the important structures are to, to really dissect and leave that, that residue behind. So I, I don't think adding a petrosectomy, you know, can, you know, if you do it right, I don't think it adds terrible morbidity, but if you cut a nerve or hit a perforator, then that's where your morbidity is gonna be. All right, Eva. Let me just switch the slides. Okay. So what we ended up, oh, do you want to say the answer or just have them answer the other no, question? No, I think, I think they covered what, okay. what those questions are. Yes. So um, we put in a VP shunt first on the first day. Then the second day we did a staged operation. We used a lumbar drain and then did a left uh, combined patrosal approach. And so ENT first did a partial translab and removed the uh, semicircular superior and posterior semicircular canal. And then we did a left subtemporal approach with a uh, quasi. And so here just to, I mean, Dr. Lou already touched on this before. Um, Dr. Morcos usually divides the clivus into four different parts. And so uh, the first quarter is from the uh, posterior clinoid to the top of the, the petrous ridge. And then um, from the petrous ridge to the IAC is the second quarter. And then IAC to jugular tubercle is the third quarter. And then the jugular tubercle to foramen magnum lip is the fourth quarter. And so um, just to, you know, this is just the approaches that he usually uses for um, depending on which quarter they are uh, for the rostral caudal level. And so here's, you know, uh, for the first quarter, it's like Transylvian. Then for the uh, Kawazi, it's better for if it's mostly in the second quarter, but you can still see up to, you know, the posterior clinoid for the Kawazi. And then for um, the posterior transpetrosal, it's better for the middle two quarters, but you can still see up to the posterior clinoid and for the far lateral, um, it's better for the uh, bottom quarter. And then retrosig, you can see, um, you know, the all four quarters. And so, and also as Dr. Velutini mentioned, you can also do endonasal. Uh, and so here's a, I'm not gonna go over this again, um, but so for our, our uh, patient, um, this is how we chose our approach. Um, so here you see, this is a posterior clinoid level. And so the tumor goes a little bit above the posterior clinoid. So here where this white line is, and then here is at the level of the petrous apex. And then here is at the level of the IAC. So you can see the tumor actually goes a little bit below the IAC. And so it's mostly, you know, it stops probably right here. And so as you can see here with the Kawazi, it's probably is not enough to reach this uh, inferior portion of the tumor that goes below the IAC. And so you really need to combine patrosal approach to be able to reach, um, you know, all of the tumor. And so that's why we ended up doing combined approach. And so uh, here it just shows we did an anterior and posterior petrosectomy in this uh, in partial translab. And then um, here, just to go over this quickly, because Dr. Lou already went over this, but here are the dural cuts uh, that he mentioned. And this is the bone that we remove here on the right um, when you do um, this approach. And so here, uh, again, is the otic capsule. And then here on this right, the top right, if you remove the uh, superior semicircular canal, you can see more of the petrous apex. And if you remove uh, the posterior semicircular canal, you can see more of the seven and eight. And so here's just a refresher of the quasi. And so for our patient, uh, this is a T1 coronal, and then it'll show the T1 with contrast in a second. 
but it, there was a little bit of um, recurrence along this cavernous sinus area. Um, but otherwise the patient was doing fine. And then this white here was just the fat graft. And so the patient just ha had a le partial left uh, cranial nerve three and cranial nerve four and six and diminished hearing um, on the left at six months post-op. Yeah. And so uh, here was his uh, six month uh, audiogram. And so he still had 88% speech discrimination score at that time. So you did, yeah. a, trans you did a transcursal there, Jacques. Exactly. Like. Yeah. No, ex I agree with you. You know, I, 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 you know, we can combine what Siviero said about the tentorium and what you said, Jim, about the beauty of the petrosal. The message is clear. The tentorium is key. And I, I just love the petrosal approach to go to the tentorium early, resect it, devascularize, kind of similar again to what Eduardo was saying about when he goes transclival to a truly a mid-clival meningioma, devascularize early. And it, it works very well. The key is not to put, to be honest, self-retaining retractors on the temporal lobe. It's completely unnecessary with the lumbar drain, you know, with these petrosal approaches. It is extradurally to drill kawazi, but once you're in the inter, intradural, CSF goes out, there's no need, absolutely no need to put self-training tractor. But, you know, I think this is what gave the posterior petrosal approach a bad name, like whatever, in the early 2000s, the vein of labe injuries and the temporal lobe injuries. And I think if we're a bit more careful, yes, it's a long approach, but it, I, I, still, I still use it quite a bit. No, I mean, no, there is no, no, no question that it's the definitive approach for this type of tumor. I mean, I don't think anybody questions that that is the case. Uh, I, I always wonder again, it, is, the, is the limit of the resection dictated by the export tumor, or is the limit of the resection dictated by the, the anatomy right behind the cavernous sinus? Both. And, I, th I think both, Siviero. I mean, you know, you've seen surgeons who've done a very small window and, you know, take 20% of a tumor because to begin with, they don't have the exposure. And then the second thing is what you just said, the texture of the tumor and adhere. No, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think it's... Right. Jacques, I would also add that um, deciding between limiting to just Kawase or adding Kawase plus posterior petrosal, I think adding that posterior petrosal on the bigger tumors, it gives you a different angle of attack coming from behind, but also looking from down to high. So there's less temporal lobe retraction as opposed to a pure kawase. Yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. Yesterday, Carolina, my, my partner and I were, did together a chondrosarcoma and, you know, we were teaching the resident by putting an instrument from the kawase and an instrument from behind the otic capsule and the two met, you know, it's that, that classic view that you want. Wouldn't, couldn't have done it, couldn't have removed that chondrosarcoma without combining the two very well, you know, exactly what you just said. James, do you, uh, do you um, do it on the same day for your combined cases or how do you guys do the drilling in terms of the timing? I think it depends on the size of the tumor. Um, you know, it, I, I would say when I first started, I didn't stage and then I learned the hard way. So then I started staging. And then I think as I gained more experience and I became more efficient, if it's a if it's not a terrible tumor, I, um, I, I go single stage. But if it's one of these large tumors and looks like you know the approach is going to take a long time, then I then I go back to staging. So it, it varies, but I've I've sort of come in evolution and and come a little for full circle as well. And then okay. I guess this is a good okay. time for the the audience. There's just a quick audience questions asking: Do you do your own petrosectomies or do you have ENT work with you guys? Uh, well, we have uh, great ENT colleagues. I think um, it, it depends on case by case. Uh, usually, if it's like a pure kawazi, we generally you know do it uh, ourselves. And then for combined petrol petrol approaches, uh, usually a combined uh, combined team effort. But some once in a while, you know, we'll, we'll do our own. I I think it's important for neurosurgeons. Uh, you know, we have to you know learn learn all of these things, and you know, so we can be a little bit interchangeable to some degree. But, uh, but team effort is always great. How about the rest of the panelists? Same thing? 
I, I do all my uh, petrosal with uh, ENT. The only petrosal approach that I did on my own were, uh, uh, again, anterior petrosectomy, but those isolated anterior petrosectomy, I have done them for sometimes uh, brainstem cavernomas, the occasional basilar uh, annuals or, or superior cerebellar artery annuals clipping. And I think those are much more limited petrosectomies. They don't have to, to expose all the way down to the IAC. They can be much smaller. So these, I think that it's important for the neurosurgeon to know how to do them because you might have to do them on the fly, on the weekend, or if you have a, 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 a um, pontine calf mal that is bleeding or something that is a little bit more urgent. But otherwise for a meningioma where I do think you need to have an excellent anterior petrosectomy, an excellent posterior petrosectomy, that is nice and wide and can be done state of the art. I do them with ENT all the time. I do, I do myself. We do in our group, my, uh, we do our anterior petrosectomy by ourselves. The posterior petrosectomy, I would say, uh, is not frequent. We use this posterior petrosectomy, but when we use, we do ourselves unless we want to do to expand anterior uh, like james showed transcrural or transcrural or even translabyrinthine approach to extension of this but i would say that uh, very rarely that we use uh, this larger approach for those tumors wonderful um okay why don't we have matt present another case then we come back to carolina to to kind of continue the questions and maybe ask some. All right, so one more case. So this is a 60 year old lady who has a history of bilateral lower extremity weakness from a diagnosis of idiopathic transverse myelitis eight years ago. And um, at that time, also during the workup, she was also found to have an uh, incidental meningioma. And three years ago, basically three years before she came to our clinic, um, she had recurrence of just the left leg being weak. And this time there was no more evidence of transverse myelitis. They even empirically treated her for it, still had weakness. And then for the workup review that uh, revealed that uh, she had tumor uh, growth. And uh, when she was in our clinic, uh, she had no cranial nerve deficits, but she was uh, a little bit weak, four out of five strength in the lower uh, left lower extremity. So this was the initial MRI from eight years ago. And of course, given that size, it was unlikely the cause of her bilateral lower extremity weakness. And uh, then during the workup, uh, for the recurrence of the uh, lower uh, left lower extremity weakness, the tumor was found to have grown. And then by the time she came to us, uh, it's even bigger now. And I also have uh, a T2 and a CTA to show you guys as well. How old is she? 60. And then I'll show you the CTA. And so um, here are some of the representative um, images. Uh, just a few questions for the speakers. Uh, first of all, how would you classify this tumor kind of similar to what um, the first case uh, was uh, asking uh, you all to do? And then how would you treat this lesion? And uh, if you were to take this patient to the OR, what surgical approach would you use? Jim, why don't you start this time? This is an interesting case. I, I think I did something similar on Monday. And um, if you look on the sagittal one, you look at the clivus, it looks like it could be po possibly inferior third or fourth, right? So I think you could, 
it's getting close to be a Freeman magnum meningioma, but then when I look at the uh, when I look at the axial, it looks like it's above the IAC, so it could be anterior petrous. But then when I look on the coronal, I think this is probably the one that helps the most. You see where the origin of the tumor is right at the the V of the Pac-Man. If the tumor is a Pac-Man shape, I think that's the jugular tubercle. So I would probably call this a jugular tubercle meningioma. I could be wrong. Okay, how how would you treat it while you you have the microphone? I I think this one. I think this one I would do a, a retro sigmoid approach and then maybe even extend it to remove the frame and magnum, you know, combine it with a far lateral just so I have that down to up view and then combine it with a true retro sigmoid up to the transverse sigmoid junction. So I have the whole CP angle uh, controlled. Okay. Siviero. Yes, I think the insertion of this tumor, I agree, is on the on the lower part of the clivus. And, and I think it, it extends a little bit high up, but the, the supra IAC extension, I think, is, is not something that I would consider for the approach. I agree that it's probably going to be centered right over the, the, the jugular tubercle. Uh, that's going to be a, a tough one because it's probably going to be uh, in front of all the lower cranial nerves. Um, so I think that retro sigmoid and then adding like, you know, a far lateral, but not really a far lateral taking out the occipital condyle, but really that, that supracondylar space of the retro sigmoid needs to be really, really uh, drilled out uh, as far out as possible. So hugging the sigmoid and exposing the back of the jugular uh, bulb really low down because as you see on the on the CT scan, the, the kind of clival depression or like, like that clivus is fairly deep. And so you're gonna have to, to find a way to, to flatten that so you can you, you can see, but on the on the CTA, you, you can see that there's gonna be some bone that's gonna be right in front of you between you and that the central clival depression. Uh, I think did this two patient have a six nerve palsy? I think she had, or it was the previous one that had deployed. No, the, the previous one. Now this one was having increasing leg weakness. Right on the contralateral side. Contralateral uh, side, yeah. So yeah, so I think she needs to be decompressed, and that's the approach I would choose. Okay, uh, Eduardo, this is this perfect for transclival, or it's too lateral on the right side? It's not and perfect. Yeah. It's not perfect, but could be used. Uh, yeah. Could you show me the first MRR? First. The first. Do you mean you mean when it was smaller? Yes. 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 Uh, you pass the the contrast here on the left side with contrast. The axial. The axial. 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 Yes. And then stop, it, there, there. It, yeah. stop there. Stop uh, there. You see. Uh, I think also it's a jugular tuberculum meningioma, this jugular tuberculum, and I, and I think it grows from the jugular tuberculum to the medial part. Sometimes it grows from the jugular tuberculum, it's centered in the jugular tuberculum, and grows posterior and anterior, but th this probably grows anterior to the jugular tuberculum. Uh, so that means that most possibly the lower cranial nerves are behind the tumor as Liviero said. And I think that then, wait, could you change for the, for the, go, for go the to the recent, MR? Yeah, recent the MRI. Yeah. <coughs> you see it goes into the, the forum in Jugular, uh, or uh, show this coronal, the coronal that you showed, before that uh, James said about the, 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 the shape of the tumor. Yeah, this right one. Right here, yeah. Yeah, this, this see that it goes a little bit lateral. So if you go for anterior approach, this lateral part probably is going to, is going to, uh, uh, you are not going to be able to remove this lateral part. But once again, what, what we, uh, what we want for the patient, we want to decompress the brain stem. Uh, probably if, if you go anterior, I think is the, I would say, 
less invasive, invasive form way to decompress the brain stem, even if you don't have a, a radical removal. And we must talk to the patient about that and say this, I can decompress the brain stem. The lower cranial nerves will be behind the tumor, probably will have less uh, risk for the lower cranial nerves. So going transclival could be an approach, knowing that probably you are leaving tumor behind. Okay. Matt? Well, I think uh, there's not much for me to add, but um, maybe just to summarize um, what um, our speakers have already said. And uh, I mean, I completely agree with everyone. You know, this, I would call it jugular tubercle meningioma with a petroclival extension and is uh, occupying mainly the middle and the lower clivus. And you can also see even on the MRI, you know, the foci of calcification is seen, uh, pointed out by the red arrows. And um, just for kind of the, the, the broad, uh, broader audience here, um, all, all of our speakers already mentioned the jugular tubercle as an anatomic landmark here. And um, just to show you more pictures of, uh, you know, the arrows are all pointing at jugular tubercle. And here, you know, eight years ago, this is what our tumor was uh, originating from there. And then you can see hyperostosis at the region of jugular tubercle. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, when considering kind of the superior and inferior extent or craniocaudal extent of this tumor, you know, I, I, I guess following Dr. Morco's qualification is mainly occupying the middle two quarters of the petroclaval region. I, I feel like the sagittal may be a little bit uh, deceiving in that it's showing that it looks to be a little lower than it is, but it didn't really go past the um, jugular tubercle when, when looking at the axials more closely, but certainly uh, didn't think that the uh, entire petrosectomy uh, was um, necessary or definitely not sufficient uh, for this approach, and it does not go above the tentorium at all. Inferiorly, because um, it didn't really go much below the jugular tubercle, um, you know, adding a far lateral approach uh, could be helpful, but may not necessarily, uh, may not be truly necessary. Um, and so that kind of leaves us with two uh, posterior lateral options and maybe one anterior approach option. So first option, um, trans, uh, petrosal, posterior petrosal approach, pre-segmoid retrolabyrinthine or even transcrucial approach. Here's what you can get. Um, you can get definitely get to all the tumor with that, but this may be a slightly longer uh, surgery than if one were to do an extended retrosigmoid or just a retrosigmoid approach where you can also directly get to um, all the tumor. Um, and um, if one were to come anteriorly uh, with a transclival slash transpetrosal approach, certainly uh, the craniocaudal extent of the tumor is not what's limiting this, this approach, but the traditional transclival approach, you're limited by the paraclival uh, carotid here where you may not be able to get to the lateral extent of the tumor unless you know you do a uh, you know contralateral transmaxillary approach which also requires a separate um, caudal luck incision um, much more extensive approach but that might be the only way um, to get to uh, most of the tumor um, and so ultimately what we chose was an extended retrosigmoid approach just for the broader audience, the difference between an extended and a traditional retrosigmoid approach, where if you expose uh, more of the sigmoid sinus, you can reflect it a little bit just to get an e even better angle of approach. And so uh, interoperatively, we found that the tumor was uh, adhering to the lower cranial nerves, as well as the uh, sixth nerve going into the drugs canal, uh, as well as stuck to the uh, seven, eight complex. Unfortunately, the bears dropped uh, by 50% interop, and then the facial nerve was able to be stimulated at uh, 0.05 milliamps at the end of the case. There was uh, five minutes in the middle of the case where it dropped to 0.1, but it improved with uh, papaverin, and uh, we were able to achieve a Simpson grade two resection. Unfortunately, only 30 seconds of the surgery was captured on video, but and it was just the beginning of the case before any resection had begun. So here you're looking superiorly where you can see the superior vein, as well as the uh, uh, trigeminal and the facial nerve. Uh, and here you're looking more inferiorly now, uh, lower cranial nerves on the right-hand side here, tumor uh, behind all the nerves, and then coming back superiorly, here's the view here. 
And um, so uh, pathology turned out to be a grade one meningioma with a KI-67 and 2%. And here's the post-op MRI showing gross total resection. How was the swallowing post-op? A uh, patient had uh, no dysphagia, but um, had uh, some hoarseness and uh, some vocal cord issues. So here's the post-op course. Uh, patient uh, woke up with the house Brackman 3 palsy, uh, slightly decreased hearing and some hoarseness. Went home on post-op day four. The leg strength did improve. Um, and then the facial nerve improved to house Brackman 1 uh, one month later. And then the sixth nerve palsy, um, which uh, the patient had uh, also improved by four months, but uh, had to wear prism glasses when driving because when looking extremely to the far right, um, patient had a little bit of uh, diplopia. And then with hearing aid, was able to hear fine and then um, had to get a uh, vocal cord injection to improve the uh, lingual spasm and hoarseness. Yeah, those, those, those tumors that are in front of the, of the lower cranial nerves, I think are formidable because you just look at these lower cranial nerves and they stop working. Uh, and I think- Yeah, it's very, I agree. I agree with you. I mean, you just stare at them. You don't even have to touch them and then suddenly they, they, they don't work anymore. So even more, if you put the CUSA, I, you know, when I was looking at the picture, I think that the transclival approach is certainly to decompress the brainstem is an incredible, uh, valuable approach because the basilar is, is all pushed to the other side. So you can really start in the midline and, and identify the, the basilar and then it's perforated and work your way lateral. But what I think is very challenging is because you're never gonna see the lateral extent of the tumor is to, to know how to control that part of the surgery and how to, to deal with, with that side of the tumor, when to stop and make sure that you don't, you don't stop too late right laterally. So I think that's to me is, is the biggest challenge because like, like Jim said, yeah. I always try to, to have at some point a, a view of the, the edges of the tumor because trusting the navigation is never something that you can do. So um, I do yeah. think, uh, you know, some of our colleagues, you know, probably Pittsburgh and, and Danny and some, and some others would probably still favor like, uh, like Matt was saying, the contralateral transmaxillary approach. Uh, and you can see that you just this picture sort of sort of highlights that you're working through that picket fence the whole time, uh, as opposed to, you know, coming from the front, like Dr. Valentini mentioned, you know, you really are getting, uh, you have much more direct access. So, so I think that's something that I, a lot of people would, uh, would to, you know, that they would consider that approach uh, in in some of these institutions that have a high volume of, of the endoscopic, the expanded endonasal. I, I think that uh, in this case, really, uh, when you are not, uh, say, when total gross total removal is not a big deal, you may leave a little, small piece of tumor. And, and then when you go in front of the tumor, then you start the second from inferior to superior, and in this case, uh, in this case, from the lateral, uh, most uh, the, the smallest lateral part of the tumor to the uh, largest lateral part of the tumor, then you can debug the tumor and from inferior to superior, from superior to inferior, lateral, uh, from medial to lateral, you can find the nerves. You can find the nerves. You can find the nerves behind the tumor but there will a part of the tumor that will not be able to remove without uh, increasing the risk of the tumor. So you go from here in this case, from the left side to the right side, and then the both the tumor, you drop the tumor from the brain stem to anterior, you, you, uh, uh, you pull the tumor anterior to see the nerves here. But the, this, this, this tumor, the, 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 this, uh, in the jugular tubercle probably will not be able to remove. But I think that you don't do even touch the, six, the seventh, the eighth nerve, and even the lower cranial nerves, you don't even see them, don't even touch them. And I think that you must balance between what is what you want, what is the purpose of the surgery, and the risks of those nerves. I, I, will, I think, of course, CSF uh, leak always is a problem. And we had a lot of problems with CSF leak, but I think it's, in this case, I would do transclival. Great discussion.
Uh, Carolina, you want to tackle the remaining yeah. two questions? And by the way, Siviero, one of the audience members would like your email. I don't know if you're comfortable. You see, if you go in the Q&A, you could type your email sure. to... Yeah. And then um, Walter Jean asked uh, if, Siviero, if you sit down for uh, the tentorial cut. If I sit down, meaning do you not do, do the like, patient. Do you do the, the patient, patient the, like the patient in the sitting <laughs> position? Not you. I hope you sit down. No, uh, no, I do them in the lateral position. Yeah, I lateral uh, position. Lateral position for me. Yes. Is that uh, everyone else? Do you guys want to? Yes, I, I I do also in the la in the lateral position or prone position with uh, rotation of the head, and I always sit. The patient not, but I am always sitting. <laughs> All right. Um, we did talk about uh, the encasement of the cranial nerves, and then one last question, um, Dr. Hannah Halak. Uh, what is the best approach or trajectory for pretracheal meningioma encasing the trigeminal nerve? dorsal root ganglion. See if you had a, you want to comment on that one? I uh, missed which one? It's what's the best approach for a petroclival meningioma encasing the trigeminal nerve dorsal root ganglion? This is I don't from know if they're, Anna Halak, this, actually. She was. Yeah, I don't know. This. Yeah. She rotated with us? No, I mean, just last week she came from Mayo oh. Clinic and had a, we had a great time. Hannah, if you're still listening, mm -hmm. hello. And uh, yeah, so, so her question is, yeah, go, you see it, you see approach, it you know? in Encasing the trigeminal nerve. I mean, if you want to control the trigeminal nerve, I, I think a petrosectomy is the best approach. Uh, whether you need to, to do a petrosectomy, you can just go subtemporal and expose a, a Meckel's cave and then the, the rest of the, the entire trigeminal uh, uh, nerve, I think that's uh, depend on the tumor. But I think the the petrosectomy, uh, the anterior petrosectomy is the only part that allows you to expose the entire trigeminal nerve uh, during it for its whole length. So that's where I would go. Jim, you want to make a comment on that, Jim? Or yeah, I, I think a, a Kawasi's approach gets you the best exposure yeah. of that root because you, you land right lateral to it and you land anterior to it. So you have great control, circumferential dissection, and you can open up Meckel's cave at the same time. I agree. All right. That's all the questions there, Jacques. Great. Any final comments from the panelists to each other or any anything else? It's seven o'clock. This was really a fantastic session. By the way, you know, they're all recorded and they're on our University of Miami Neurosurgery YouTube channel for people to go back and, and, and if they missed any parts. So we're there for posterity. And that means we can always quote you if you change your mind later, we can tell you, no, that's not what you said during that session. We can always change our mind. You learn right. a lot with a lot of, you right. have learned a lot today. So I think uh, we, one, we one thing that's day. important. Yeah, I think one thing that's important for the audience members, especially, be, you know, being a junior faculty starting, these, these are really, like they said, treacherous tumor. Don't let the, don't, us, don't underestimate uh, the difficulty of some of these tumors. And, and as you sort of plan these out when you're starting out, got to really prepare yourself from all different angles and, and be ready for these cases. They're long and very difficult cases. That's correct. Very humbling, very humbling cases. Very, yeah, very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was, again, tremendous. And see you soon you, somewhere Jack. live. Thank okay. You. Ricardo, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Caroline. Ciao, ciao. Prazer. Ciao. Un abraço.